Coming up on Jerusalem Dateline, the IDF making strides in Gaza as Hamas appears to be losing control. Jewish students on U.S. college campuses take legal action because of anti-Semitism they experience daily. Plus, chilling evidence of a curriculum of hate. How the Palestinian Authority approved textbooks teach children from the youngest ages to hate Jews and revere terrorists. All this and more coming up on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. Now in the third month of the war, the IDF continues to advance throughout the Gaza Strip. Israeli leaders see signs Hamas's support is crumbling. Monday night, Israel's defense minister declared Hamas is near a breaking point in northern Gaza, marking a huge turnaround from October 7th. Among those who surrendered are also terrorists who participated in events of October 7, the same ones who went on murder sprees that killed children, who raped women, and are now in a situation where they only have one option, to die or surrender. As the humanitarian crisis grows, Israel plans to increase aid to the people of Gaza. But this video shows some aid is being commandeered by armed groups. On Israel's northern border, the IDF is responding to an increase in Hezbollah fire into the country. It's a front the White House is concerned could escalate into a regional war. We absolutely don't want to see this conflict spill over into Lebanon. We don't want to see a second front. We don't want to see it escalate and widen. Um, and so it is also in the context of that uh, that we're, uh, we're concerned about these reports. In another risk of escalation, Iranian-backed Houthi militia in Yemen struck a Norwegian oil tanker it says was headed for Israel. No injuries are reported. As the UN General Assembly prepares for a vote on a resolution calling for a ceasefire, Iran condemned the U.S. veto of a similar measure in the Security Council last week. The U.S. government once again demonstrated its full-fledged solidarity with the Zionist regime and its full complicity in these regrettable crimes against the oppressed people of Palestine. As the IDF continues to advance in northern and southern Gaza, a stark warning from Hamas about the hostages. A spokesman warned on Sunday that no hostage will leave the Gaza Strip alive without an exchange of more Palestinian prisoners in Israel as well as other demands. 138 hostages remain in captivity, including 20 women and two children. IDF troops continue to uncover evidence of Hamas hiding its war machine in civilian areas. This mosque included a Hamas training site, including a room used for combat simulation, weapons and explosives. The IDF also said it found bags from the UN Relief and Works Agency mixed in with the Hamas weapons. A Congressional House panel is investigating Penn, Harvard, and other universities for their failure to address anti-Semitism. In some cases, Jewish students are suing their schools because they don't feel safe on campus. CBN's Brody Carter reports from New York. The Jewish population in New York City is roughly 10 percent. At Columbia University, they're in the top 15 of private universities by Jewish population. And Jewish students that we've talked to at CBN, they tell us they simply don't feel safe here. One freshman even filing a lawsuit against the university for failing to protect her against anti-Semitism. I choose to be hopeful that nobody would attack me physically, but do I feel emotionally safe? Do I feel welcomed? Not in the slightest. Daniela is a 21-year-old freshman at Columbia University. Before her studies, she served in the Israeli Defense Forces as part of the Search and Rescue Brigade. After October 7th and subsequent war, anti-Israel protests flooded the university. Daniela even received death threats on the anonymous social platform SideChat. She's now suing the university for allowing anti-Semitism to thrive. I'm asking for the administration to step in and ensure that anti-Semitism cannot run free on my college campus. And I think that's the minimum. We're talking not just about verbal harassment, um, anti-Jewish epithets being hurled at Jewish students as they walk to class, for example, but we're also talking about acts of physical violence. 
Mark Ressler, partner at Kasowitz, Benson & Torres, is representing Daniela. He's also suing NYU on behalf of three other Jewish students, alleging civil rights violations for its anti-Semitic educational environment. In an email, Columbia acknowledged the lawsuit and the Department of Education's investigation of seven colleges of reported incidents of anti-Semitism. Posters of Israeli hostages have been spread throughout New York City streets. Many have been defaced, even torn down. Now Jewish community leaders are calling it for what it is. This is terrorism. This is terrorism. Rabbi Dov Yana Korn leads a Jewish community of more than 1,300 students and young professionals at Chabad House Bowery near NYU. He says the spike of assaults, vandalism, and harassment against Jews have led to a 30% increase of young Jewish students leaning into their faith. Right, this is horrific, but thank God the Jewish people react well under fire, and this has caused such an explosion of Jewish life and Jewish community and Jewish optimism and Jewish faith and Jewish practice. Educational consultant Jennifer Brozo says the failure of certain universities to stand against anti-Semitism is having a negative impact on early school choice. Unfortunately, it's a little bit too late. And a lot of students have just, they, these schools are off their list and they're going to other schools. Whether these investigations and lawsuits tarnish the Ivy League reputation is yet to be seen. Now Jewish leaders encourage allies and partners with the Jewish community to stand against anti-Semitism as the fight makes its way to our nation's capital. Reporting in New York City, Brody Carter, CBN News. Coming up. How officially sanctioned classroom education has created a generation of terrorists. David Bedeen is an investigative journalist from the Center for Near East Policy Research who has spent much of his life chronicling UNRWA, the United Nations Relief Works Agency, and its work with the Palestinian Authority educating the youth of Gaza. They have shaped a whole generation. Take a look. David Bedeen, director of uh, Center for Near East Policy. Tell us your reaction when you found out what happened on October 7th. I was not surprised to hear what happened on October 7th. The people in the UNRWA camps have been training their young people for this, this very attack. You'll see from our movies that the kids are trained to kill and without any, without any hesitancy, without any feelings, and they, this is, they've been going through training exercises for years, and they upgraded their exercises only a few weeks before the events of October 7. We warned, uh, I brought my experts uh, to, who have been uh, witnessing these and filming these and who know intelligence. We brought our experts on September 27 to Israel Intelligence to warn them. And, that, and so it, it hurt that we were correct. When you say UNRWA camps, are you talking about uh, <clears throat> separate from, say, Hamas camps? Uh... UNRWA is running, UNRWA, uh, running refugee camps, employing the people from Hamas who, are the, who dominate the workers' unions and the labor unions. And the, the UNRWA uh, schools, the UNRWA summer camps, the UNRWA youth clubs, all run by Hamas who are getting a salary paycheck from UNRWA. So are you saying there's like an incestuous relationship between the two? I'm saying they're the one and the same. UNRWA and Hamas are one and the same, with the knowledge of everyone. Mm. Wow. Who's funding this? <clears throat> the UNRWA is funded by 20 major nations and 33 relief agencies. Now, one of them, the United States, has done the right thing. The United States, with the urging of Senator James Risch, the ranking Republican in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, created an UNRWA-U.S. accord, which forbids UNRWA from taking the money that the U.S. allocates unless they change their school system. And that was that I credit Senator, Senator James Risch for making sure that would happen. Now, what, what I'm talking about school systems and whatever, it's, it's stories like this. You see, we were able, to, just from the Palestinian Curriculum Department, which supplies UNRWA with their books, this is a, this is a, a recent book, recently re, reinserted into the UNRWA curriculum after it was taken out for six years, thanks to the head of the UN who saw this book when we brought it to him in 2018. This was reinserted in the book. This is Dalala Mugrabi, who murdered 36 Jews in a terror attack in, in, in um, 1978. And she's glorified in this book, and there's a whole curriculum for her, run by UNRWA. 
UNRWA TAKES THE BOOKS from the, FROM THE PALESTINIAN AUTHORITY AND RUNS THEM. NOW, WE ASKED ALL THE DONOR NATIONS, ALL 25 DONOR NATIONS, WILL YOU like, TAKE THE BOOK OUT? NONE OF THEM RESPONDED. They didn't even give me the courtesy of a response. And I, I, I like to bother people. That's what I do as an investigative journalist. And I, I saw them, the, the, the ambassadors and the, the consuls personally. They didn't do anything. And there's a, there's, a, there's a lobby in the Knesset. We tried to get them to do something about it. But this is, this is the uh, smoking gun. Of, I've worked on the UNRWA issue for, for a good 36 years. And when the curriculum became the, the Palestinian Authority curriculum became the UNRWA curriculum in 2000, we have gotten more than 1,000 books to go through. If we found us, if we, as honest people, had we found one sign of peace, we would have reported it. There is no sign of peace. But this is not only a sign of peace. This is teaching children to, to be like Dalal al Mugrabi and murder Jews. It's not that they hate Jews, they're trained to kill Jews. There's a very big distinction here. And that's, that's, what we, and that's why, in anyone's, if anyone says they're Nazis, the Nazis try to cover up what they do, they do not cover up anything. Just that the media has been irresponsible, the donor nations have been irresponsible and not responded to it. They well, if it's out of the media, we don't have to work, worry about it. Now we have many people who have been murdered, and many people were killed in, in combat because of this, this negligence. And there will be in, in investigations, there will be commissions of inquiry in the, amongst the donor nations and in Israel itself. Mm. So. It begins with the Palestinian Authority curriculum. That's right. That is adopted by UNRWA. Precisely. And that is taught in their schools, both in the West Bank and Gaza. That, and in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the curriculum taught in the Palestinian Authority, and, and uh, it becomes the curriculum taught in, the, in, in UNRWA. We're talking about UNRWA in Judea, Samaria, and Gaza, and Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And thousands of children being poisoned, being poisoned at their, their work. And I have here report which is on our website, which is israelbehindthenews.com, a uh, report on the, which summarizes the three principles of Palestinian Authority UNRWA education. One, de delegitimization of Israel's existence and the Israel's Jews' very presence in the country. Two, demonization of both Jews and Israelis. And three, the absence of any call for peace. Now, I'm naive. A refugee camp run by the United Nations is supposed to uh, adhere to the values of the United Nations, not to the garbage of a, of a terrorist organization, but that's not what they do. I'm naive. When I was, when I was young, I, I grew up in America. Uh, my parents taught me to, brought me to meet Eleanor Roosevelt. I was 10 years old. I was so impressed. That was my first impression of the United Nations. But that's, we don't see any Eleanor Roosevelt amongst the in, in UNRWA education. And one theme and only one theme. I was asked by a very prominent reform rabbi, please give us some examples of, 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 of peace in the education. I'll pay you $10,000. I don't, I, I, we need the money, but we're not going to compromise the principles. The, the direction is one direction, war on the Jews. And by the way, not only Jews in, in Israel. It's like, the, it's like their pay for slay law, that it, which has never been repealed, right? That it's that, that which, which allocates a salary for life mm -hmm. for anyone who murders a Jew. And it's applicable everywhere. Yeah. Well, David Bedeen, thanks for joining us on CBN News. We'll follow this up uh, in another conversation. Okay. I'm going to give you this as a copy to CBN and, and people who want to have copies of this book. We have extra copies. People want to see our, our site. We have the expression I'd like to use is let my people know. Thank you. Thank you. Still ahead, how terrorists get created. We'll visit a Hamas summer camp for kids. As David Bedeen mentioned in our last segment, some Palestinian young people spend their summers in killer camps run by Hamas and Islamic Jihad. This story from a few years ago shows how the medieval mindset taught to this generation laid the foundation for the murderous siege of October 7th. They call them the pioneers of liberation and the sword of Jerusalem summer camps run by Hamas and Islamic Jihad. These videos posted by Memory, the Middle East Media Research Institute, show what the youth of Gaza are doing this summer. We did not come here to enjoy ourselves or to play or anything like that. We came with our souls, our blood, our martyrs, and our wounded to sacrifice ourselves for Palestine and for our people. 
This promotional video urges students from primary school, high school, and college to participate. In the camp, target practice involves AK-47s, anti-tank weapons, and video simulations. So that in the next phase, Allah willing, these boys will be able to confront the plundering enemy and disfigure its face in the next war. In May, Hamas and Islamic Jihad called the 11-day war with Israel the Sword of Jerusalem. Their goal, preparing the next generation for the next war. We say to the enemy, these children picked up these weapons and we train them how to use them as well as how to take security measures so that they will follow in the footsteps of their fathers and take up arms, Allah willing. I chose to spend my vacation in the Pioneers of Liberation summer camp in order to continue the path of my father, the martyred commander Walid Shamala Abu Bilal, in order to strengthen our determination and to liberate Jerusalem, Allah willing. These young men and boys learn anti-Semitism at an early age. We asked Hitler why he left some of you alive. He did so in order to show us how wicked you are. We will come to you from under the ground and hammer fear into your hearts, and above the ground we will tear your bodies apart with our rockets. Scram into the shelters, you mice, you sons of a Jewish women. Memory has been monitoring these summer camps for 10 years. The videos and images from those camps illustrate and reflect the way Hamas is operating and deepening its control. In 10, 15 years from now, the kids will be adults or parents and maybe even an official in Gaza and decision makers. So the extremism in Gaza will be even worse. Hamas took over the Gaza Strip 13 years ago in a bloody battle with the Palestinian Authority. So since birth, this generation has been raised only on the values of the this terrorist movement. This is, of course, only deepening the crisis there, thwarting any chance for a dignified, peaceful life for, for the kids and for all the residents of Gaza. She feels the international community needs to speak up about these camps. While these kids are in camp, Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh is visiting nations like Mauritania, pledging to continue the war against Israel. Let me tell you, my brothers and sisters, the sword of Jerusalem will not be sheathed until the blessed Al-Aqsa Mosque is liberated. Given these summer camps, it appears clear the goal is that the battle for Jerusalem will continue into the next generation. Up next, a traveling exhibit from Jerusalem, building bridges and inspiring hearts half a world away. Thank you for watching Jerusalem Dayline. We're committed to providing you with unbiased reporting from the Holy Land. Through weekly broadcasts, podcasts, and online media, our vision is to reach millions around the globe with the true story of what's happening in Israel and the Middle East, all from a biblical and prophetic perspective. This is a big vision and is only made possible by the generous support of people like you. Call us toll free at 1-800-700-7000 or go to cbn.com slash Jerusalem Dateline and make a donation that will help spread the light of truth about Israel throughout the world. As the Israel-Hamas war continues, a unique endeavor is underway to encourage U.S. support for the Jewish state. It includes bringing the history of Israel to American communities. Charlene Aaron shows us how it's being done. The traveling exhibition of the National Library of Israel features 18 highlights from the library's collections. The goal is to inspire personal reflection on Israel and its history as it fights for its security and preservation. The library is really thinking of itself as playing the role of reviving the spirit and the soul of the country. Despite the October 7th attack and ongoing fighting, the newly renovated National Library of Israel officially opened October 29th in Jerusalem. While operating on a limited basis in the Holy Land, a world away in Virginia Beach, its treasures showcase the country's humanity in the face of inhumanity. National Library of Israel USA CEO Adina Canefield gave CBN News a tour of the gallery at the Reba and Sam Sandler family campus. Here she points out a note from Hungarian Jewish poet Hannah Sines, who was executed for helping Jews escape the Holocaust. She says, my dear beloved mother, I have no words 
you alone will understand why there is no need for words. With endless love, your daughter. Local leader and library board member Art Sandler hosted the community event and explained why the display came to Virginia Beach. When I started learning about the library, I could, just couldn't believe what was there. I live here, so I wanted, my, I wanted my friends and family and my community to see it. Sandler hopes the exhibit can raise awareness and support for Israel in the face of growing anti-Semitism. Apart from standing with Israel, there's this issue of Jew hatred that's just really come to the surface, and, and it's, it's terrible. And so, so we have to do everything we can to combat that on the home front. That includes a focus on what's happening on college campuses, according to David Makovsky of the Washington Institute and president of the library's U.S. affiliate. A lot of these people are chanting things from the river to the sea. You're talking about eliminating one whole people. Exactly. So I think, I think the library is, is going gonna, is gonna to be there to, not to get political, but uh, to bring people together around ideas of knowledge. Makovsky also pointed out how the library's old building in Israel is being used as a classroom during the war. They're not in their schools and they're, they've been, you know, re, you know, been displaced. And the library's trying to fill that gap and have special programming uh, for the kids so that they, they, they don't miss the regular experience of being a kid and going to school. Many visitors came away inspired after taking in the history. The uh, terrifying ordeal, it's, it's a page taken from the Holocaust, what they did to us. And it is refreshing in a way to be reminded of how much we have given to the world. It's so important to have this library open now and to ha show the world that we're still existing, that we still have hope. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on social media and access CBN content through our CBN News and other CBN apps. Don't forget to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, protection for IDF soldiers and all civilians currently in harm's way, and for the release of all the hostages still in captivity in Gaza. I'm Chris Mitchell. Happy Hanukkah, and we'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.